Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. Hey, man. Patrick. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be fun, man. For me, uh, coming out of high school, I actually wrote in my yearbook, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I always knew that at some point in my career, I want to start a business. It still holds true. Was that the same for you? <clears throat> uh, you know, the funny thing is that I think the first business idea I had was probably when I was, I don't know, like six years old. Yeah. And I think that my idea was uh, that I wanted to invent a motorbike. Really? That ran on Bovril. Okay. I don't know if okay. you know what Bovril is, but in no South clue. Africa, Bovril is like, it's kind of like Marmite. Yeah. You know what Marmite is, right? Nope. Okay, so it's like a veggie extract kind of weird stuff. And you oh, okay. it's, it's a spread for bread yeah. at the end of the day. And Is it marmalade? Uh, it's not marmalade. It's like more like a salty spread. You put okay. it with butter and you kind of, yeah. So anyway, I, uh, I told my dad, when I grow up, I want to uh, invent a motorbike that runs on Bovril because Bovril <laughs> was my favorite spread. Yeah. So <laughs> that's basically where that's it all awesome. started. That was yeah. my first uh, business idea. Obviously, I... Realize how ridiculous that is mm -hmm. in retrospect. Hopefully, but, uh, pretty soon. But well, yeah, maybe maybe one day. I mean, <laughs> after after this, I'll uh, I'll give it a go. Maybe, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's the next one. That's the next business. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. So you started out as a software developer, um, also had a role as a CTO. Yeah. And somehow you started your own business. How did that go? Uh, well, okay. So you know, uh, the truth is that over the years, I actually started a few businesses. Okay. Most of them are just in the graveyard. Most of them are just like really bad ideas in retrospect. Yeah. And um, uh, I actually, when I went through university as well, I, I did uh, computer electrical engineering yeah. and I really enjoyed the, the, you know, the, basically like all the learning and stuff, but I didn't really um, see myself like climbing the corporate ladder in the software world. It just sounded very bland to go from junior developer to intermediate developer to senior to architect. And, you know, that's the Holy grail. Yeah. And so when I actually left university, I thought to myself, well, you know, that's what I want to avoid that. And so the first job I got was ultimately as a, uh, you know, I just took a kind of a half an internship in a sense uh, with a company that was doing some kind of software, but they were like, look, let's just see where you end up. Yeah. And quite naturally, so they had like um, some kind of a configuration system. It's almost it's similar to low code in a weird way, like very, very old, you know, very dirty stuff uh, to be okay. honest, but it was database configuration. And I found myself just uh, gravitating towards writing a lot of the SQL and, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's almost like the program in me just started coming back out again. Yeah. And then before I knew it, I was like, okay, cool. After the, after about a year there, I thought to myself, geez, you know, I could, you know, thrash these guys because the software is so terrible. Yeah. And that was my first business. It was called Syngenuity Software. Okay. And I said, I'm going to basically do what these guys are doing, but I'm going to just do it better. Yeah. Okay. Which is... Uh, you know, as a 23, 24 year old guy, that uh, seemed like a good idea. <laughs> and then after about s eight months of just blowing all my savings yeah. and like just building a lot of stuff and doing a lot of research, uh, I realized that, oh, you actually need a sales function to a business. Exactly. So I went out and I actually tried to uh, sell it mm -hmm. and I got actually quite close, like scary close to actually selling what I was <laughs> doing. Uh, I'm so glad that didn't go through because I probably would have been in a lot of trouble because there was no way that I could have delivered what okay. I was trying to sell. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that business ultimately like went down. And then I just decided at that point, I was like very clear to me that actually software was my love yeah, and that I just loved building stuff. Uh, but I had this deep desire which I think a lot of developers do at some point in their life. I had this deep desire to um, to essentially know what the right way to do it is. Yeah. And so I went and I you know hunted around uh, South Africa and I said, well, you know, where's the most prestigious uh, consultancy slash you know software house yeah. that I could possibly join? And I ended up joining a company which uh, had really, really, really solid guys. And I was very lucky because all the projects that I had there, I was there for about five years. I ended up in management by the end. Yeah. And um, you know, all the guys I got to work with over the years were just really, really super talented, incredible guys, very strong architects. And I got introduced to a lot of the concepts yeah. and actually did a lot of training there that uh, we've, you know, kind of built upon in the business that we've built today. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. How, so obviously you joined that consultancy firm, but I still am missing kind of the bridge in starting your own company. You joined that for five years, <laughs> climbed up the ranks also. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically when I ended up coming uh, at the end of my career there, yeah. I was in management yeah. and uh, so therefore I wasn't being as technical as I used to be. Yeah. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was actually really unhappy. 
Okay. okay. But I'd come off a very super, super challenging project previous to that. Like we're, do, we're doing a lot of management around many, many projects and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd met the co-founders to Intent Architect at the time as well. Um, but I was really unhappy in management. And so that's when the opportunity as a CTO came about. Yeah. And in fact, we'd already decided that we wanted to start this company at that point. Okay. And so we'd, you could say that we were uh, side hustling. Yeah. Uh, towards the end of that part. And I was when I joined the company as a CTO, we already actually had something going. And um, essentially the story was that uh, that company had to, the company where I was a CTO, they had to do a lot of new software development. Yeah. And because of that, there was this opportunity where we could take this tooling that we'd built, which we ultimately built based on, you know, because of the problems in the software industry that we had been experiencing over the years that we were working as architects at the consultancy. Yeah. And um, we took this and said, well, look, you know, we can use this. And I checked with the other guys who, in, in, as part of Exco, and I said, would you guys be interested in, uh, in giving this a go? And they said, sure, that sounds great. Yeah. And it absolutely uh, dominated. Yeah. You know, we, we ended up rebuilding uh, five years worth of software in like six months. You nice. know, so it was incredible what we were able to achieve. And, and, you know, everyone was just flying and the quality of the system was so much better. And, you know, the consistency and the architectural structures and everything like that that we were building out was just, um, you know, it was incredible. And I, yeah. could, and I could sleep very well at night, even though I had, you know, quite a, like a bit of a junior team. I could sleep very well at night because I knew exactly what the software looked like. Yeah. And so when we, you know, this progressed, I, I was there for about uh, just over two and a half years, I think it was. And uh, before I, I told the guys, like, look, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be moving on to building this company. And they were very, very supportive of that. I actually gave them an entire year to, uh, to figure yeah. out what they wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, guys, in one year's time, I'm going to be going full time into this business. Exactly. And, uh, and they, I mean, they've been basically a paying client from day one. They're still with us. They, yeah, uh, that was you know, your first client. It was our first client, ultimately, at the end of the nice. day. Nice. Yeah. But you built it then, let's say, as a side hustle, obviously, you had a job. Yeah. You did this more on the side, probably with the co-founders. How many co-founders? Uh, so we're three co-founders, yeah. all engineers. So, I mean, if we kind of, you know, rewind the story basically back to the beginning. So yeah. we were all, we were basically, uh, so all engineers working as architects in this consultancy. Yeah. And we were managing, you know, quite a variety of different projects at the end of the day. And so what we were seeing was that, you know, I mean, in terms of size, you're dealing with, you know, uh, I'm talking in rand terms here, so you'll have to do some division. Yeah. But it was like, you know, 30 million rand, uh, you know, 10 man dev teams, two and a half years with Q QAs and BAs and, and project managers and everybody on these teams. We were dealing with some really large stuff all the way down to, you know, four man team, uh, you know, five month delivery, you know, smaller stuff. Yeah. And so what we ultimately realized was in the software industry, there is essentially a set of trends yeah. that everybody is experiencing. And, you know, we've had an opportunity now and the privilege in a sense to have spoken to so many developers and so many architects that it's so clear to us how universal these trends are. Yeah. And so when we analyzed that and we looked at the situation, the first thing we realized was that actually software development from the perspective of developers and the architects is actually a very repetitive process. Yeah. Okay, and it's not that, let's just for argument's sake say that, and developers typically don't repeat themselves, but let's just for argument's sake say that they never write the same line of code twice. Yeah. Yet it's still very repetitive because all of the tasks that they're doing, even though it's a new use case, is very similar to the previous use case because yeah. it follows the architecture, it follows the patterns that the team has agreed upon. So in this, we saw a huge amount of waste. Yeah. Okay, like we, we estimated probably between 70 and 80% of developers' time is all of this like repetitiveness yeah. that's surrounding the use case that they're trying to achieve. So that was the one side of the things that we realized. The second thing that we realized was, you know, when a, t when a project starts, you end up with a certain velocity. I mean, this is to quote the Agile guys. Sure. You know, the velocity of the team starts to come out and usually it's very, very quick in the beginning. So, you know, about the four month mark, that's when you really see the team is starting to, to chug. Yeah. And they're, you know, outputting use cases pretty quickly and things like that. But you can come back and you can visit that team, uh, you know, a year and a half later. Yeah. And there can be massively different results depending sure. on the project, depending on the team. I mean, we've, we have, you know, spoken to people who are telling us that, you know, back, you know, when they started their project just two years ago, you know, they were going, uh, things that used to take them a day to do then are now taking them four, five, six days to do at yeah. this point. So this deterioration in velocity is something that we notice in the projects as well. Yeah. And it's almost like you can, you know, a lot of teams through discipline, through architecture, through certain structures and the code bases and things like that, they're able to stave off this deterioration by almost taking a, a velocity hit in the short term. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of documentation that Martin Fowler has, has backed this up. Um, so when we analyzed it, we thought to ourselves, well, you know, what is causing this deterioration of the software? 
And, um, you know, the first thing that came out was, and was so very clear, was technical debt. Yeah. Okay, now, everyone knows what technical debt, very, very well documented. Um, but what we noticed more than anything in software is that technical debt is something that just seems to be growing. Exactly. Okay? So it's continuously growing in the system. And so the agile guys are telling you, well, look, you know, for every single sprint, we highly recommend that you bring the technical debt in. Yeah. Okay. And we recommend that too. I mean, that's a, you know that's the only way to actually uh, to avoid exactly. it from becoming out of control. But exactly. the thing is that in a lot of ways, when you look at it, really as developers, what we're doing is trying to stop the bleeding yeah. from getting out of control. But it is still growing in the system. So that's the first thing is that this technical debt is there, it's growing and it's starting to compound yeah. in the system. The second thing we notice is that there's lots of inconsistency that starts to develop in a code base. It's like okay. it's entropy. It's a form of technical debt. Yeah. And the thing you about mean inconsistency in the way people in, in, do things in the w in the way guys are doing things. Yeah. In like in how each case is, use case is implemented. There's always just little inconsistencies that are coming through, and it's not really anyone's fault. Sure. The first thing is that like uh, everybody on the team doesn't understand the architecture exactly the same way. Exactly. It's impossible for them to. They're different human beings. But yeah. you know, let's just say that on average, it's if there's an overlap of a certain amount, there's always going to be someone who doesn't, or everybody on the team who just has some little bit of a different view of how things are done. Yeah. So that's the first side of it. The second is that there's different skill levels. I mean, that's just, you know, there's different experience levels, sure. you know, to the developers. And then of course, you know, besides the fact that maybe they've got different styles even, you know, the team can also realize that there's better ways to do things. Yeah. But then it's very expensive to go back and fix it. All of so it. you're just like, well, and so this, if you extrapolate this problem, it kind of compounds as well in the system. Yeah. So you've you got this technical debt. versus new. Exactly, exactly. So you've got this technical debt compounding. You've got this um, inconsistency compounding. Yeah. And the other thing that we realized was that there's uh, an architectural rigidity. Yeah. Okay. So past a certain threshold, making certain architectural changes in the software is very, very hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, probably one of the biggest examples of this. So like a team, when they build a piece of software, yep. you know, if they know what they're doing, they'll analyze the non-functional requirements and they'll say, well, you know, I think that this architecture is going to work for us. Exactly. But those non-functional requirements can shift. Yep. Security requirements can shift. Hosting requirements can shift. Certain, even like, you know, performance requirements and things like that, availability requirements can shift. And so what ends up happening, if you think about it, is that then the architecture doesn't necessarily support those non-functional requirements. Yeah. And a great example of this is actually the move to cloud. Yeah. Okay, because cloud, um, if you think about how many systems were architected for on-prem hosting, now have to be rewritten. So this architectural rigidity is so huge. I mean, this is a big example, yeah. you know, that when cloud came along, it's literally still causing, I mean, the number of companies we talk to that are saying, well, right now we're remodernizing, we want to be cloud, you know, cloud enabled. Exactly. And so that basically means we're rewriting our entire piece of software, Yeah, you know, for the cloud. So that was the next thing is this architectural rigidity is a huge force as well. And the sad thing, and this really bothered us, is that this applies to technologies too. Yeah. So you build today on a set of technologies. Which that, might be obsolete. Exactly. And so, you know, in a few years time, it's just not the latest one. And developers always want to work on the latest technology Number one, they want to leverage what the technology offers. Exactly. Okay. Uh, even though from a business perspective, you're like, look, that wouldn't make the business a much better business at the sure. end of the day. But developers want to do that. So it starts to compound into almost a human resourcing issue. Yeah. Because you can't keep good developers if you're not giving them what they want at yeah. the end of the day. So this is another problem. And so if you look at the big picture of basically, the, you could look, think of it as like the painting that we've basically painted at this point, yeah. is that this is what we think of as the tendency towards legacy. So, you know, the, the academics will tell you, well, the second you write a line of code, it's legacy. But developers don't see it like that. No. Developers think to themselves, this is not a legacy system, it's still fresh. Yeah. Okay. But then they've got this funny thing and it, there's no, you can't say, well, it's two years old, therefore it's legacy, or it's 10 years old, therefore it's legacy. It's a there feeling. Is, it's, it's a feeling that developers have. And it's usually because the technical debt is getting out of control. Yeah. It's very inconsistent, very hard to maintain. Making changes is difficult. There's certain maybe non-functional requirements that have shifted and we can't make those architectural changes. So we're having to like hack it, adding to the technical debt yeah. to get around this problem. We're also stuck on old technologies. And so this is kind of, and this is actually the fate of almost all software, which is very sad. And it's almost like something that the whole industry just ignores. And in fact, I think some people thrive on it. They're like, well, this is good news. We're going to be doing a rewrite every few years. You know? yeah. So, And, you know, developers just love having that blank slate because, of course, we're never going to make the same mistakes we made last time, which is probably true. Yeah. It's just going to make a whole new set of mistakes. Exactly. You know? So that's typically how it goes. And the final thing that we, we picked up is that um, the, there's no blueprint. 
there's no blueprint to the systems that we're building. Yeah. And it's, you know, in a lot of ways, and, I, you know, we were talking about this uh, the other day, you know, th in a lot of ways, it's like a new joiner comes to a project and it's, they have to basically walk into, it's like walking into skyscraper. Yeah. And the dev team says to them, well, you know, the blueprint's all around you. Yeah. But the only way for him to really know what the design of this app is, is he's got to go break into the walls. Exactly. He's got to check, okay, so the plumbing went through there, going yep. to the ceiling, electrical cables down there. And then, of course, he goes to the second floor and it's inconsistent. It's yeah. different. They did it differently here. Third floor, different. Yeah. And so it's really hard. Or you might get an outdated blueprint. Uh, exactly. And any company that gives you a piece of document, well, you know, sometimes, firstly, uh, it's very expensive for developers to make documentation. Yeah. You know, they can spend almost longer building the document than it is coding it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so that document can be really expensive. And then the second thing is that if it doesn't reflect the underlying code, yep. it's worthless. Exactly. Okay. Because now you're looking at a blueprint that's not true. Yeah. So that's, you know, and of course the update documents is also incredibly expensive, more expensive than updating code. Yeah. So, I mean, this was essentially where Intent Architect started. This is essentially where the problem space that we found ourselves in and we, we said to ourselves, well, you know, we need to solve this. And we looked around and we saw the low-code guys were there. Yeah. You know, the main indexes, the art systems, the Appians, the sales forces, they, you know, they've, they're around. But yeah. the truth is that software isn't a cookie-cutter mold. You know, it's not like you, you can't, not all software follows the cookie-cutter. Yeah. And they are offering a cookie-cutter solution. So if you're doing what they support, you are the happiest guy. Exactly. The second you want to step out of that or you want to control the underlying architecture or you've got a funny non-functional requirement that you have to handle, you can't do it. Yeah. So we saw that and we saw all the different ways that guys were trying to handle these things and you know where all the different patterns and DDD and microservices and where those all fit in, but nothing was really ultimately solving the fundamental issue. So yeah. when we boiled it down, we actually realized that at the center of it all is an, is an issue that is almost a catalyst to everything. And ironically, it's code. Yeah. Okay. It, it, that's the ironic thing. And developers always look at us when we tell them this and they're like, what do you mean it's code? It's like, no, no, no. Code is beautiful. We love code. Okay. <laughs> Don't get us wrong. We love code. It's just how much code yeah. we have to deal with. Okay. And we call this the weight of code at the end of the day. So okay. it's, it's like it's got a weight to it. Yeah. And you could think of it like sand in a way. Um, whereas developers basically have a shovel. So, you know, you just end up with these mountains and mountains of sand all over the place and all you've got is a shovel, two hands and a keyboard. That's yeah. really your tool. And so this weight of code is actually causing a lot of these issues. So think back to the technical debt. Why does technical debt exist? Yeah. Well, it's because, uh, you know, there's too many lines of code that we have to change in order to get rid of that, you know, correct the design, get exactly. rid of the hack and get rid of the technical debt. At some point, your, in, your complexity increases to it, such it, a point that it just gets a whole operation exactly. to change it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's just an inconsistency, too many lines of code. You yeah. change that in order to get uh, the, the system to consistency. Uh, the, you know, to upgrade this technology, we've got too many lines of code against this API. The next version of the API, breaking changes, we would have to change, you know, 10,000 lines of code. It's going to take us, uh, the team is going to take them three months or six months or whatever the time is. Yeah. And the business is like, I'm sorry, we can't afford that. Exactly. You know, even though the developers want to do that, the business would love to do that. Yeah. But no one can afford six months. Yeah. Okay. So that's really where, if you look at it, it's the fundamental. If you if you ask our opinion as a company, we we've analyzed. It, we think that there's essentially two problems in software, two fundamental problems in software. Yeah. And the first is weight of code. Okay. Which is almost like your inadvertent complexity. Yeah. Okay. And actual complexity. Okay, so complexity of the system is like what are the non-functional requirements, what are the functional requirements, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So between those two, and you could map every single thing in the software industry yeah. at trying to handle one of those two, two things. You know, what is microservices trying to do? Microservices simply trust trying to handle weight of code. Yeah. That's it. That's all it's trying to do because it's definitely not handling complexity. No, exactly. It's taking your complex problem and turning it into a distributed it complex way problem. More complex. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I mean, and you know, I'm a huge fan of microservices. Sure. Okay. At the end of the day, because it does force a certain way of thinking, which is actually quite powerful. Um, but at the end of the day, it's you know, DDD is is all into um, complexity handling, yeah. and it does do some level of weight of code because obviously, the any kind of separation of concerns, any kind of low coupling, is good for weight of code. Yeah. You know, because then you change less to get certain changes in. And that's the key. Yeah. Circling back then to yes, Intent yeah, yeah. Architect. <laughs> yeah. So coming back to Intent Architect, this is essentially what we decided we were going to do is we were like, we're going to tackle this problem space. Yeah. And so when we, you know, myself and the co-founders, we said, well, let's, you know, let's build a company that's going to solve this. The way that we did that was we said to ourselves, well, um, you know, let's imagine a world of software dev yeah. uh, from the perspective of a developer as an ideal world. Like how would it look in an ideal world? 
And we came up with a few set of ideals or principles. Yeah. Okay. And the first one was uh, what we called code weightlessness. Okay. okay. So the inverse of code, uh, weight of code. Exactly. And code weightlessness, you know, if in the most layman's definition, is basically the ability for developers to be able to change 10,000 lines of code as easily as just changing 10. Yeah. Okay. So that's code weightlessness. Uh, the second ideal that we said was uh, really that you should have um, what we think of as a agile, or not an agile architecture, a free architecture. Yeah. The agile architecture, I'll get to that in a second, but sure. uh, a free architecture because whenever you come up with an architecture as a team, you come up with some kind of a, you know, a structure that you believe is going to meet the non-functional requirements of that project. Yeah. And at that point onwards, there's actually a lot of work that goes into every single use case to put that architecture in place. Sure. And this is what we estimate to be around, you know, so if you say on the back end, you're probably looking at around, you know, 70 to 80% of the work. Okay. okay. Maybe more depending on the project. Sure. It can be a, re a hell of a lot of work to, depending on how much complexity you're trying to handle. Exactly. You know, so that's basically the big thing is that like you're, you're, if you've got a complex project, you tend to tend to have a complex architecture. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, you know, having this free architecture was an ideal for us because yeah. once you know what it is, surely you shouldn't have to pay for it every single time. Now, of course, paying for a new use cases is, is expensive, but actually shifting an architecture as use cases need to change yeah. is five times more expensive. Exactly. You know, that's it's, your foundation. Yeah. It's, it's just changing code is so much harder, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was the second ideal. The third ideal we set out was this idea of having this agile architecture. So sure, you've got your free architecture now, but an agile architecture is the idea that should something change later, we realize a better way to do things. The non-functional yep. requirements shift. We need to bring in a cross-cutting concern, something like that. Um, should we have that, uh, we should be able to make that change in the system, regardless okay. of how old that system is. So that system could be five years old. It could be thousands of use cases. It could be a massive system. And, you know, successful systems do tend to get large yeah. okay, because you do tend to enhance them and add lots and lots of features. Exactly. And, you know, while you're adding features in a linear sense, they're all interconnected, so your complexity is skyrocketing. Yeah. So ultimately, that was the next one is to say, well, you must be able to change things for free. And then we said, well, take that one step further you know, you should be able to extrapolate and say, well, then that should be applied to technologies too. Yeah. We should be able to stay on the cusp of the latest technologies. That's an ideal. As a, as a software developer, you want to be able to stay up to date. Yeah. And that's essentially what we um, we decided from an ideals perspective to build a company on. Uh, the one last one that I just wanted to mention is that uh, we also said that a system should be self-documenting. Okay. And what that means is that you should have a blueprint for the system. Yeah. But the key is that that blueprint must be true exactly. to the underlying code must base. Must always reflect the truth. The truth. If it doesn't, it's worthless. Yeah. So at least at a contract level, because I mean, if you think about a blueprint, that's what, uh, it's a contract yeah. for what you want your system to be about. You know, the fact that you just say like, you know, wall from here to here, red brick, this plumbing configuration, that electrical configuration, yeah. and then the guys go and build it. So ultimately, you want to know that if I've got this line here, that that is the truth of yeah. what's lying in the code base. So that's essentially the ideals that we set out, and then you know we built a lot of the, the we built a lot of this originally for ourselves. Okay, yeah. that that's the truth is that we said, well, this must be a tool for us. We built uh, a fair amount of it. Um, you know, up to a point, we're still like a console that used to run, but a lot of the principles were in place. Yeah. And uh, we're at Noxico, we had this, and this is where I did the CTO uh, role. Uh, we ultimately brought this in and this is where we were able to leverage this power. So because of the code weightlessness and because of the free architecture, we yep. just saved huge amounts of time. Exactly. Okay? We were able to fly and also we had the quality because yep. everything was perfectly consistent. We also had these blueprints because now we could see the systems and that made it very easy for us to reason about what the changes should be for the next feature. Yeah. Because I mean, that's the biggest problem sometimes is you sit in a room with your fellow developers and not everyone's on the same page. Exactly. And then you sit there arguing about something, you're like, I'll show you in the code base after this meeting, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that argument happens all the time. So, I mean, yeah, just to tie it back, you know, uh, kind of like the long-winded way of how we got to this company, no I guess. <laughs> yeah. But ultimately, we, you know, when when we saw the success that we had, yeah. uh, you know, at this at this company where I was the CTO, um, you know, I said, this this thing's got legs. Yeah. And, you know, we, we did a little bit of a push out to, uh, you know, just people that we knew. And we said, hey, guys, we've got this thing. I mean, it was still, you know, version 0 0.8 or something at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we actually ended up, you know, catching the tension of this, um, of this individual who was on a project at one of the banks. Yeah. And he chatted to the guys at the bank and they were in a little bit of trouble. And they said, well, you know, this tool could actually help us in this space. Yeah. And so they brought it in and they were able to get what they wanted at the end of the day. So they've been a client of ours, you know, so that was awesome. first client off to the second one. Exactly. So the funny thing is that um, 
I, I remember when I decided to leave the company yep. and go full time into this business, um, I, I had this idea that we were just going to hit the ground running. Yeah. Okay. And I think if anything I've learned building this business is that you've got to keep a fridge jam packed with, you know, ready and stocked with humble pie. Exactly. Because you're going to have to get that humble pie out. You're going to have to cut yourself a slice, warm yep. it up, and you're going to have to eat it all the time. There's never going to be a day where it's just going to like, all like things can start falling into place. And yep. the moment you get excited about it, just wait. You're gonna to have to get that humble part of the fridge. You're gonna to have to eat it. Yeah. So that was, um, you know, when we decided to go to market straight afterwards. I went and I set up lots of meetings and I, you know, ex basically went through my network, and we got no one. Yeah. Not a single client out of that. And I mean, that was such a blow. Think, yeah, having that's this, a punch in the gut. It's such a punch in the gut. And I think it's really because you know, being so new to business, yeah. you don't realize how hard it is. Like, there's not you don't walk out into the business world and just start selling. Exactly. You know, especially if you've got something that's unique. Yeah. You know, like guys are like, well, we haven't heard of you guys. That's the first problem. And there's a technical complexity there as well because people need to understand it before they can actually put it to practice. Yeah. 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 Big time. Big time. Exactly. I mean, we we had no idea how to explain this this uh, this product uh, probably up until the end of last year. Yeah. You know, we were just explaining it in every way we could think of. And it just wasn't hitting home. Yeah. And so it took us a long time to actually figure out, you know, if, if we have a, a conversation with a company, how to actually explain what this tool does and how it can help a company at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah, that's something you need to hone probably and you need to make it razor sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like I say, man, it's just been, it's, a, it's, I think that one of the biggest challenges has been trying to figure out how to commercialize something yeah. that you've done. I mean, if you say like, who are the competitors to intense architecture? You're like, hmm, that's a bit of a hard one, yeah. okay? Because no one's really in the same space as us. You sure. know, I think that the low code guys, you could say, oh no, are you guys a low, we're not a low code platform. Yeah. We're a 100% code platform. But before we get into that, yeah. I, you know, I know, uh, but we haven't really laid out on on what it actually does. Yeah, you've laid okay. out the problems. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into competitors. Yes, later. yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay, so I mean, just to give an idea of what Intent Architect uh, is yeah. at the end of the day, so it's um, it's a software tool yeah. uh, for developers and for architects. But I think that there's a few things that are worth just knowing about. The first is it's not a low code platform. Yeah. Okay. So um, so it's it's also not something that introduces runtime dependencies or it's not a framework at yeah. the end of the day. So in a lot of ways, it's not something you build on top of. So you don't build on top of Intent Architect, you build with Intent Architect, yeah. okay? You know, so a, a, an example would be if we go back to our developer analogy of developers having shovels, yeah. it's like you go from a shovel to having a TLB and you know, one of those tractors that can pick stuff up. And exactly. You've got like drills that are electrical and you know, stuff like that. So you've got automated tools, yeah. okay, that just do the work for you. So that's really the thinking, and, and a lot of ways that um, you know we explain it to developers is that the that the footprint, okay, if you want to think about it, like the, the footprint of Intent Architect is the same as an IDE, yeah, okay. So if you think about what an IDE is, it's something that's installed on the local machine. It manages the code base, so yeah. the files that make up the code base, and it can do you know some pretty advanced management. So for example, you could rename a method in your a code lot of base, things, yeah, and then it'll re if that method is called in twenty files it would go and update all those 20 files for you. Yep. Okay, so that's amazing. I mean, then you, otherwise you have to go run through each and every single file. Yep. So Intent Architect has the same kind of footprint in the sense that it's installed on the local machine yep. and it manages the underlying code base alongside the IDE, but it's not a replacement for an IDE. Okay. Okay, so that's key. So yep. a lot of guys are like, hold on, so you're saying it's an IDE. It's like, no, it's not an IDE. It's not a replacement for an IDE. Yep. It's an add-on. It's, it's, it's something exactly, it's, it's basically the developer is going to be continuing coding yep. using the IDE, which is where he'll spend still the majority of his time, but Intent Architect is where he is designing. Okay. Okay. So he designs his blueprint, yep. Intent Architect. And the two of those tools together, in a way, and we use quite fancy mechanisms uh, at the end of the day. It's, uh, I mean, one of the things we do is we call ourselves a next generation code automation platform. Sure. Yep. And, and the reason for that is because, yes, we are managing code and we are doing automated code generation, which is something that has been around for eons. Yeah. Um, but we're doing it in a completely unique way so that the developer and the automation tool can actually coexist. Yeah. Okay. And that's, I think that's really probably what makes it practical at the end of the day. And it's probably been one of the major reasons why we've had so much success yeah. uh, up until this point. Cool. So let's put it in a use case. I want to design something that stores a user in a database. Mm -hmm. Do I first go to Intent Architect, model my uh, business domains, and then go into my ID? Or how, how would I put it to practice? Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, traditionally what guys would do is the first thing they would do is, let's say a new use case came along. Yeah. Okay. The, the team, or at least like the more senior guys in the team, probably 
would go into a whiteboard room and they would start whiteboarding. And yep. so they'd say, cool, we've got these entities. They'll lay them out on the whiteboard. They'll draw relationships between them. They'll say, well, this gets, this is what gets persisted. This is what we're going to have. These are the services we probably need to set up. Maybe this is the front end. Maybe we're in a microservice architecture. So these are the events that we'll publish. And they kind of lay all of that out. Yeah. And then they will go and they'll take screenshots of that with their phones and they'll hand it over maybe to the BA or if it's very technical, they'll keep it for themselves and they'll just talk about it and everyone's on the same page and they'll go and like write it. Yeah. So the difference between that and, you know, a team that uses Intent Architect is they'll also whiteboard session this, but then they'll take that whiteboard design and they'll, and they'll capture it in Intent Architect. So we've, okay. got, we've got powerful modeling capabilities. Yeah. So you can model out exactly what you wrote on the whiteboard. Okay, these are my domain entities, this is their relationship, these are the services, the eventing, all of that kind of stuff can be modeled. Yeah. And so by modeling out that contract, we then can use Intent Architect to actually automate that architecture that yeah. holds it all together. And so that's the second part of Intent Architect is what we call pattern reuse. Okay. So you can have patterns that have been installed into that kind of workspace and we call them modules. And ultimately those can output the code for you exactly the way that you want it. So it's yeah. something that the developers are controlling. It's not something that we prescribe. We're not a prescriptive tool at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? Kind of, yeah. Um, you also mentioned it's it's framework agnostic and it's also code agnostic. Yeah. How yeah. does it do that? Just kind of high over. Okay, so okay, so it basically, um, you know, how, how Intent al uh, Architect ultimately works yeah. is, is you've got these three mechanisms, which you could think of as having... Uh, you know, they're essentially, you could say, three pieces of the same puzzle. Yeah. Okay. And the first is what we call this pattern reuse, which is the modules that I just mentioned. Exactly. So if you look at any architecture, you know, you could say, well, you know, in a typical, a very kind of vanilla architecture, or maybe you're following like a, let's say, a Robert Martin, you know, Uncle Bob's clean architecture. Yeah. You'll say, cool, well, we've got some kind of controller pattern, which is handling the the, uh, the calls from the, the API calls at the end of the day. So it's handling that. Then we've got a dispatch to the business logic, which is using a mediator pattern probably. So it's commands and queries for the CQRS. Yeah. And then you've got your entities, you've got maybe repository patterns, you've probably got some kind of an ORM in the mix if you're using a relational database. And, uh, you know, maybe there's factory patterns and specification patterns and all kinds of stuff. Now, all of these patterns, ultimately, you could, the idea behind pattern reuse is that you could take any one of them and you could turn them into a module, which essentially automates that pattern going forward so yep. that you can get it for free. So that's the first mechanism. Okay. But to make that possible, we've got two other mechanisms. The one is uh, what we call code management. Yeah. Okay. And this is really an advanced form of code generation. I think that's quite interesting, but it's a little bit more technical. And then the uh, the last uh, kind of piece of the puzzle is the modeling systems, yeah. the ability to describe a blueprint of the system. Okay. And um, I mean, to do a little, you know, you know, kind of understanding the um, the automation side of things in terms of the code management yeah. is that you've got these, uh, I mean, we're not language agnostic completely. Okay. okay. I mean, Intent Architect can automate any file. So sure. you are language agnostic for the most part, but code management is actually something that we have particular support for a set of languages, which, was, which we are expanding on. Yeah. So at the moment, we're very, uh, we're very much in the C sharp Java TypeScript space with a vision to go into the Go and Python and so on and so forth. And uh, it's really just about uh, kind of, you know, choosing the languages which are getting the most popularity amongst the devs. Sure. And uh, so essentially what it is at the end of the day is if you think about, so it's probably easiest way to describe it is to, to talk about code generation, code automation in the industry. Yeah. And then to ex compare that with what code management is. Sure. So if you look at the industry at the moment, you've essentially got, um, you've got two types of code automation. Yeah. The first is uh, scaffolding. Sure. Okay. Now everyone's super familiar with scaffolding. It's like any kind of, you know, command line interface where you're just punching in some, you know, create me a new this and yep. it just drops some code into your code base. Or you've got a CLI, uh, you know, a snippeting tool, something like that, yep. where you can just snippet stuff inside of your, uh, your IDE. So any kind of, uh, you know, once off generation of code, you know, to speed you up yep. is essentially scaffolding. Sure. And that's exactly what it does is it speeds the developer developer up from A to B yep. in a short period of time. It's not dangerous because assuming they get what they want, let's just go ahead and assume that. Assuming they get what they want, yep. they are able to change it. Exactly. But it doesn't have any long-term benefits. Okay. Okay. So that's the problem. That, well, it's not the problem with it, but it's just that it doesn't solve any long-term issues. So if we go back to our things about technical debt, yep. uh, you know, ultimately that code is still the liability of the developers. Sure. 
So, you know, and that's the truth is that code is a liability. The more yep. you have, the more you have to maintain. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's not an asset. The, <laughs> the product is an asset, but yeah. the code is a liability. Sure. Um, so, so that's, so scaffolding, great short term accelerator, no long term benefits. Doesn't okay. really fix our long term problem we yeah. described earlier. Um, on the flip side of that, you've got this uh, thing we call really continuous automation. And essentially, this is something that is usually done by the dev team. And it's very attractive in some senses, but it's basically got a downside, which is so huge that it oftentimes invalidates the approach. Yeah. So essentially, the mechanism is that the developers have written some kind of a, a little you know, system or an engine, which is piping metadata. So like an, ex an easy example would be, uh, you know, database schemas or swagger yeah. files or, you know, some kind of specific stuff that they've created, maybe JSON objects and stuff like that. Yeah. And they're piping this metadata into a templating engine, which is outputting code into the code base. Yeah. Now, if it's done really, really badly, which is most of the time, it's like this single file that looks absolutely convoluted. And you don't want to open that thing in the IDE. You ignore, like, here be dragons. Okay? Yeah. That's basically the problem with this. And that's a that can be a nightmare in and of itself. But yeah. if it's done really, really well, um, then it'll be individual files and they'll look exactly like a developer wrote them. Yeah. Okay. So there's, you know, from that perspective, there's no issue. Um, but, and there's essentially there's two sides to it that I've, that I was mentioning earlier. And the first issue is, uh, well, at least well, let, let me rather go through what uh, attracts developers to it. So sure. what is attractive about this approach is number one, you're using automation. Yeah. Okay. Which is something that every developer loves. So you're using automation, which means you're saving yourself a lot of time. You don't have to write that code. Yeah. Okay. You just say, well, create a new database object in the database. This is my relationships. These are my foreign keys, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And boom, all of a sudden you get uh, your entities, maybe your, your ORM mappings and sure. maybe your repository as well. Okay. Which is very common. You see a lot of this kind of stuff. And uh, what's really powerful about it, so beyond the fact that you're getting this, this code, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking with my hands. Exactly. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, beyond the fact that you've got this like automation and you've got this acceleration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's very attractive is let's say, for example, you're automating some kind of uh, technology. Yeah. Okay. And let's just use the example of an object relational mapper, like sure. an, an ORM. So um, let's say, for example, you've built it against version five of whatever ORM you're using. Yeah. Okay. And version six comes out with significant breaking changes to the APIs. Yeah. Now you want to stay up to date. So what do you do? You go to your template and you shift what your template outputs yep. to now adjust to the new API, yep. okay? You hit it again and it just overwrites, maybe you could have a thousand entities in your database yep. and you change 10 lines of code and you just updated 10,000, yep. okay? And therein, if you, you, you know, if we come tied back to what we we're talking about earlier, yep. therein is the most basic form of code weightlessness. Exactly. The ability to change 10 and update 10,000, yep. 20,000 or 100,000. And also self-documenting. Well, it's it's not self. Do it's it's a little bit like if to you a if, you, if you exactly if you consider your database to be your document okay. of your relationships, then that is self document Yeah. So as long as you've got that document, that is to some degree self document Exactly. Yeah. But so if you're I mean, taking the the Swagger file example, well, swag still your it, it, Swagger. It's uh, I mean, Swagger is a document as well. It's you, true. The the true uh, at the end of the day, what you want is something that is true to the underlying code base, and by having that document yeah. and having it continuously update. It means that you can look at the Swagger document yeah. or you can look at the database or you can look at whatever you're looking at uh, from, you know, maybe you're doing it in XMI. So you're exporting it from some other modeling system or something like that. Yeah. And uh, you can know that because of this templating system that what you're looking at is the truth. Yeah, and exactly. so, yeah, that is self document. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, def I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I mean, no maybe worries. it sounded like I wasn't agreeing. I'm like, yes, no, no, 100%. No, I totally agree with that. Exactly. Um, so that's the upside. Sure. Okay. And the upside's very attractive. That's what pulls, that's what draws guys in. Yeah. The downside is massive. And this is where code generation in the industry has a very, very bad name. Yeah. Okay. And it is, the downside is bad. It's okay. very, very bad. Um, and this is basically, it's probably easiest just to illustrate with an example. So let's say you had to make a change in a method. Yeah. Okay. In one of the files that was being managed by this template. Yeah. Okay. So you go in there and you make some change as a developer. And let's just say it is 100% legit. Like yeah. you're not trying to be funny. You're like, exactly. This is a legit change. You okay? need this. You need this. Okay. Yeah. Which invariably is going to happen. Yeah. Because software is not a cookie cutter. Exactly. You know, there's always something that you want to tweak or optimize somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And um, what happens? The templating engine gets kicked off again because of course it's continuous. Exactly. It's kicked off again and it just whacks out your changes. Yeah. Gone. 
And if you can't get around this, and I know in like, for example, the .NET space, they uh, they tried bringing in partial classes. And sure. in the Java space, a lot of guys use inheritance. And I mean, they you basically, you just convolute your code more and more and more. Yeah. So it's ultimately just a hack at the end of the day, but you convolute your code more and more to try to get around these problems that the automation engine is causing. Yeah. And there's always a breaking point where you are not able to get around it anymore. Okay. okay? And it's at that point that the chair will fly across the office. Exactly. It's at that point that someone is strangling the architect and telling him what he thinks. Yeah. Okay. And so this is uh, this is the downside of it that in, in basically invalidates it, or at least for the most part, it keeps it in very uh, specific spaces of the software. Yeah. So that's why you'll still see guys having some level of success with, for example, database to ORM mappings, or you'll see guys having like Swagger automating their proxies. Exactly. You they know? know where to apply it. Where it's, it becomes an asset and not a crutch. Exactly. You're applying it in a, in a space where it can't be dangerous. Yeah. Where you're not really going to want to tweak things. Exactly. You hope you're not going to want to tweak things. That's, yeah. you know, there's, there's other ways. You can maybe intercept things and make your changes through interceptors. But you still are sometimes having to convolute the software a little bit to get around your automation system. Yeah. So tying it all back to what code management is, yeah. is code management is a system which we envisioned where basically we looked at the landscape and we said to ourselves, you know, we really like this code weightlessness thing. Exactly. We can see the power here. But this downside is so massive that, you know, no one's going to accept that. Yeah. Okay. You also can't, you know, especially the closer you get to business logic, the more that automation systems start to break down. Yeah. Okay. And so when we looked at it, we said to ourselves, well, how do we get the best of all worlds and just kind of eliminate the downside? Yeah. Okay. And essentially the idea was we said, well, okay, uh, let's develop a system which could do that. And that's what code management ultimately is. It's a, to it's a, it's a term we've coined okay. Okay, to try and differentiate it so that guys consider it different to yeah. typical code generation. And I think this is maybe jumping a little bit technical, so we'll just kind of brush over it quickly. Sure. But essentially how it works is we use ab uh, a combination of abstract syntax tree parsing yeah. and algorithms to actually understand the code in the code base and the code that's coming out of the automation system yeah. um, at the same, as code, yeah. we understand those the same way the developer does. Okay. So we see, for example, if you're looking at like an OO language like C Sharp, we will see the classes, the methods, the constructors, the uh, the properties, the fields. We see all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. And we see that in the code that exists too. And then with algorithms, we can make intelligent decisions as to how these two worlds must be joined together. Yeah. So the idea and the principle is that by using an automation system, it never puts you in a worse position than if you wrote it all yourself by hand. Okay. And you can see that there's obviously, if that's your first principle, an offset of that principle is that whatever is automated should look like I wrote it. Exactly. Okay. So those are kind of two, you know, complementary principles. Yeah. Okay. So the code must look like a developer wrote it. That's number one. And the second thing is that I'm using an automation system. It should never ruin my day. Exactly. I should never fight this thing. It should never become that crutch. It should never, well, it's not, it's, it's not a crutch. It's just like, uh, it's, it's this massive liability that can come into the system yeah. at the end of the day. But um, so uh, just to give you an idea, kind of going back to our use case. Uh, so let's say, for example, the developer wanted to make that change in that method. Yes. Legitimate change. Okay. And they went and they made that change. Their automation engine runs again, takes the change out. Yeah. With Intent Architect, we could say, for example, in C Sharp, you could put a attribute over that method to say, Intent, ignore this. Okay. Or in Java, it's an annotation. In TypeScript, it's a decorator. Yeah. You know, so whatever language, we find a way to add metadata to the file. And you want it in line there because then you can see exactly what's going on. You don't yeah. want that hidden somewhere and you, you don't know where. Exactly. And that level of granularity can be applied anywhere. But yeah. it's essentially an override. If, for example, I, I put this, um, uh, you know, attribute to yeah. say ignore this method, from that moment onwards, that method, but only that method, is now under the developer's control. Yeah. The rest of the file is still under the automations control, which means that I've still got code weightlessness over that entire design, yeah. Okay, which means I can still change it holistically from one place. Exactly. And like I say, you can apply this override at any level. You can apply it to uh, you know, the class or individual methods or anything like that. Yeah. Another example is where you say, and this is where the granularity gets very fine, is you could say, well, actually, I want Intent Architect to manage the signature of this method, yeah. but not the body. Okay. okay. And what that allows is it allows, let's say you're automating a whole world of infrastructure yep. around a certain contract that your blueprint is describing. So let's say, for example, you're describing your business contract uh, or at least your service contract yep. for this is what I will expose out, this is my DTO, this is kind of the operation. Yep. Um, you could say, well, I'm going to automate all the infrastructure, but then at some point we've got to get into business logic coding. Now, business logic is not it's not great to design that in models. Exactly. Because it becomes uh, it becomes like a... 
a big ball of spaghetti at the end of the day. Like it looks like a circuit board, yeah. you know, it, two, four loops. And it's like, what is going on here? They're trying to wrap your head around that. But if you saw that in code, it's just so obvious what's going on. Yeah. So code is still the best way to handle that kind of complexity to still govern the thing. So that's why, you know, the we don't, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why we, d we don't see the, uh, the low code guys really winning on this one. You know, you st code is still going to win yeah. uh, when it comes to structuring business logic. You've got all the patterns, you've got, uh, you know, the whole golf pattern set. You can use decorators and strategies and composite patterns and all kinds of things to handle your complex business issues. Yeah. And um, ultimately that's, uh, you know, with the, with, with saying like, look, I want you to manage the signature. Yeah. You can end up tying all of the infrastructure to the business logic and you've drawn a line in the sand and said, cool, at this point. I'll take over. It, I'll take over. Yeah. And so you can have the automation run all the way to the point of the business logic and then the business logic, you know, the developers running that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then it can hand back over to infrastructure. Okay. And by doing that, you can end up automating, um, you know, it said 80% of a backend, 85% of a backend. Yeah. And you can see how much, I mean, for a lot of people that use that on new projects, we just see them flying. Exactly. Like absolutely flying. Yeah. How do you manage those overrides though? I'm guessing you have something in place that tells you, all right, this is where you've put your overrides. Uh, so when you re rerun your generation, this is what will happen. You just put it in line in the, in the code. Exactly. Yeah. So if it's in line in the code, it means that there's no confusion. Yeah. And also you don't want to be jumping around. So you don't want to have that hidden in the background. You're like, okay, is this thing overridden or not? It's like, exactly. oh, it's right there in the code. Yeah. It's not a runtime dependency. It's like an empty metadata. So it could be a comment. Yeah. You know, it could be anything. We, you just need something to indicate, hey, you must stop here yeah. and I'm a, a developer is going to take over this or this is the rules. And of course you can, you can instruct the system in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So, I mean, if it, just to tie it all back, you know, it's, it's this code management which makes it practical yeah. at the end of the day. So having that is essentially um, what I would say is, it has made us what we think of as a next generation code automation platform. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So then let's circle back to you decided, all right, I'm going to do this full time. Yeah. I'm going to hit sales and I'm going to hit the ground running uh, and then no sales. What yeah. happened then? Um, so we, the first thing we thought is that uh, the product's not good enough. Yeah. Okay. And I'll be honest with you, we, we were just so naive in the early days of starting this business. I look back in it in retrospect. And um, the truth is that we, uh, we had a build it and they'll come yep. kind of attitude. Okay, if we build just the most beautiful piece of software that just has all the functions you could possibly want, yep. people will just want to buy it. Okay, now that has led to an incredibly mature product. Okay, yeah. so we've got a really mature product. You know, we've got a third version and all of that stuff. Yeah. But from a commercial perspective, uh, yeah, man, we just got slammed. And a lot of it came down to, what I realized is a lot of it comes down to how do you communicate? Yeah. How, do you, how do you communicate these ideas? Especially in a space where you're a first mover. Exactly. Now, and all the reading I've done in first movers is that actually, you know, they'll say you've got an advantage, but the evidence is actually massively that you've got a huge disadvantage okay. by being a first mover. Yeah. So we're a little bit cognizant of that. Because you've got to pave the way. You've got to pave the way. You end up educating a market. Yeah. And you end up creating this market. And then someone else comes along and says, well, hold on. Um, you know, this is something that we could possibly do as well. Yeah. Okay. So our, uh, our approach to that is just basically to say, well, let's be cognizant of that. And let's make sure that we don't, that the product itself is, uh, is, is the best that we can fathom. Exactly. You know, you so don't want anyone overtaking you. If they've got better ideas. Exactly. So we're like, we must have the best ideas. So, yeah. that, and I think that that's, you know, that's really the culture that we've, we've essentially built in the company. How did you get your product to, to such a maturity level? Because you need that customer feedback, I'm assuming. Well, the, uh, the, the lucky side of it was that we always, uh, so we dog food it. Yeah. So we use it to build itself. Exactly. Okay, so that's, that's number one, <laughs> nice. uh, which has been a massive accelerator for us. Okay, yeah. so of course that makes our development a lot faster and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and also, of course, we had our clients. So we had the clients coming with real, you know, these, some of the guys started scaring us with yeah. how they were starting to use the tool. Okay. You know, uh, as an example. In what way? Uh, well, so as an example, they started using a, um, a domain designer. Yeah. You know, for entity relationship diagrams. They started using that and a combination of like what we, what we kind of borrowed this idea from the yeah. UML guys called stereotypes. And essentially they started building out workflows. Yeah. So they started using the domain <laughs> systems for workflows. And uh, we got a fright. We were like, this is, it's a bit of a bastardization of what the tool is meant for. Yeah. And so that sent us down a path where we said, well, geez, you know, we actually need uh, the ability to count, configure and yeah. customize the designing capabilities. Yeah. And that has been one of the features which gets so many devs incredibly excited is this idea that, hold on, we can, 
you know, you're not telling us how to design a system. We can come up with it ourselves. Yeah. You know, we can like literally make up concepts and then model them out and then use that to automate all kinds of things that we haven't even thought of yet. So, yeah. you know, we've since seen some really interesting stuff. So workflows is a common one. You know, yeah. guys will end up uh, creating their own workflow designers with their own, you know, structures and maybe the, uh, the one, uh, one of the insurance companies uh, in South Africa that uses our software has, um, they use like, they have like SLA uh, associations and things okay. like that, like 45 minutes between these two steps and da, da, da. So they've got like all these unique things and it's quite structured and it fits perfectly into their, their world. Yeah. And we've seen guys do things like infrastructure as code, you know, like describing their pipelines, describing their deployment strategies and stuff as models, yeah. uh, including testing stuff. So the more vanilla stuff is of course, entity relationships, um, services, eventing systems. Yeah. And, uh, you know, recently we've been doing more and more front end related stuff, you know, structuring okay. our front ends, but from a contract perspective. And that's the key is that your blueprint is a contract. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be, we, we don't see ourselves jumping into the drag and drop, you know, editor anytime soon. Yeah. Ultimately that's, that's in the HTML. That's where the devs need exactly. to do it. Exactly. That's they, something else. Exactly. You you want the, the devs need to still have all the power. Remember the philosophy. It's like yeah. we, we don't you never want to be in a worse position than if you didn't than if you wrote it all yourself. Yeah. So that's the kind of philosophy. At the end exactly. Of the day. If I were to use that tool, can I reuse what uh, what other people wrote? Is it kind of yeah. open and I can use the modules they created? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean uh not necessarily the ones that our clients have created. So sure. they, they keep those, it's a form of intellectual property for an organization. So if yep. they've gone and built a set of modules, yep. uh, that would be theirs. Okay. And, you know, we can't tell them guys, you need to give this to the world. No, exactly. But all of our modules that we built as examples, yep. so guys can get a feel for what the tool's all about, those are all open source. Exactly. So it's available and guys can download it. And, you know, we've just been implementing architectures that we see as quite uh, yeah, uh, popular. Yep. So... Uh, an example is in the .NET space, we recently implemented Uncle Bob's clean architecture. Yeah. And so, you know, that comes in with uh, with all the all the different Jimmy Bogart's libraries and, and the patterns and stuff. And, you know, what's nice is that because we get to see so many different ways of doing things, in a sense, we can kind of see the pros and cons. And then we just choose the one that we think is the best. Of yeah. course, there's pros and cons to every approach. Yeah. So we just pick those. And then, you know, we've got some, some guys who say, well, we love these patterns. They're perfect. We're going to use them. Uh, but a lot of clients, they just love getting behind the wheel yep. and they want to manage their own modules. And so that's something I would say that's the majority of the stuff that we're doing at the moment. And we love that because ultimately this tool was built for them. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So you've got your product, which is, I'm guessing you're happy with the maturity level now. Uh, yeah, so I'm guessing you're going to focus on commercial level more then or, or what's your plan here? Well, the thing is that, uh, yeah, I look for myself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. For the rest of the team, it's product, product, product. Yeah. Uh, the reason is that, you know, Ultimately, by the time I think that anybody wakes up to that, this is actually potentially the best way to be building software. Yeah. Um, by the time we hope that that you know the community wakes up to that, that will be so far along that if anyone wants to jump into the game, they'll be playing you know years of catch up. Yeah. So that's the thinking around like the product. Also, we see so many ways to improve the experience. You know, so you know you, you want faster feedback, and we get this feedback from clients all the time that like yeah. it'll be so great if this, it'll be so great if that. And we're always sitting there analyzing that and saying, well, you know, what is the best way for us to bring that into the product and get that out to, uh, to, exactly. to back to them so that they can get they can use it. And I think that's quite cool as well, right? The, uh, the the devs that are using our product at the moment feel very much involved because a lot of the features that they're asking for, you know, a month or two later, it gets released, and we're yep. like, there you go, guys. You know, this is what you've been asking for, and they're like, oh, it's been you know, it's been great. But yeah. I've also got these ten other features. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah, that's how it goes. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point we left off, you had two customers and, and obviously you were trying to focus on sales. How how far along are you now? So, uh, well, we're, we're much, much further along at the yeah. moment. So we've basically, um, I mean, over the years we picked up uh, another corporate. It's funny how the corporate seem to actually, you know, if you've got the right connections in a corporate, it, it'll open up to you. But if you go to a corporate from the outside, yeah. cold, it's, it's, quite shoot you down. It's, it's quite difficult. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, is it's also you know they'll make you jump through a thousand hoops and stuff like that, and they get yeah. to they get to bully you uh, as well as a small yeah, that's company. Hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then they're just like, oh, you know, we'll only pay you this. This is the budget we've got. And you're okay. just like, well, I'm just so glad to have you on the books. You know, <laughs> so yeah. you just you just kind of put up with it. But I think we're getting to a point now where you know we've we've ramped up quite massively in the last while. I mean, you know, our client base is uh, is is getting close on ten. 
nice. we're hoping to, we've got a, a set of new clients uh, at the end of the day set on, you know, basically almost doubling that just in the next few months. Yeah. So it's really started taking off at this point. Um, we finally figured out how to explain it. Yeah. We figured out how to, what the fastest way it is for a team to start getting the benefits. Okay. And uh, we we just know how to do everything. So it's at this point that we, uh, we're we really just looking to scale it up a little bit, go a little bit faster. Yeah. And my thinking is really just from a strategic perspective to say, well, let's run this engine at, you know, the 500 RPM, 5,000 RPM okay. mark. You know, you don't want to go into the red. You don't want to be in six or 7,000 RPM. Yeah. You know, going so fast, you know, we reckon that if we pushed it, we could probably do, you know, eight new clients a month. Yeah. Um, but then but, time is still but a factor. It would just be insane. It yeah. would be, you know, we would have no time to really look at internalizing and retrospecting and so on and so forth. So, exactly. So that's really the... Uh, um, yeah, the, the the kind of strategy at this point, but I think we're very we're very uh, lucky to be where we are. Yeah. Uh, we've got um, you know some really uh, kind of prestigious clients on the books. Yeah, uh, we've got a pipeline which is looking awesome. So you know, with a lot of a lot of interest uh, coming in. So at this point, it's it's just looking like we're going to sail. But like I said earlier, I keep a fridge. Packed full of humble <laughs> pie. <laughs> exactly. So, so should uh, you know, it's it's we're still you know we, we're at a point now where we can say we've got product market fit, but you know there's always going to be some curveball. Exactly. Yeah. I'm guessing you wrote a lot of the code yourself and a lot of the platform yourself, and you're still very much involved. Yeah. No, I, I wrote I wrote a fair amount of it. Uh, I definitely could not have done it without the team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The guys are. Uh, I think that what uh, was really great about the team is that I'm working with probably the smartest. Uh, software engineers that I have ever met. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've got a list of guys that I'm like, they probably could be good enough. Yeah. Um, but it's not a long list. You exactly. Know? So I think that we've been very lucky in that sense. And these guys have come up with incredible, incredible ideas uh, over the years and, uh, and implemented some amazing stuff. So, you know, I think that that's also the key, right? Is you've got to be an ideation hub. You've yeah. got to be like continuously coming up with ideas and thinking about things. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to make it sound like I did, uh, you know, it's, sure. it was all me. It was, it was the team. That's awesome. more, more than, uh, more than myself at the end exactly. of the day. Yeah. How is it hiring a uh, first hire then and trusting them with, let's say your thing? I mean, it's your product, it's your baby. Well, and I you're think that someone into the fold. Yeah, I, it's slow. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of outside edges where one can start dabbling with a tool and getting a feel for how it works yeah. before one gets into the core. Exactly. And uh, the core at the moment is really just myself and one of the other engineers who uh, do, do play around in the core the most. Okay. Um, and that's because it's you know it it is complicated. Yeah. You know it is it is under the hood. It's a uh, it's funny how like over the years, in so many ways we've simplified, but at the end of the day, the simplification and the generalization that we've brought in has made made the power incredible. Yeah. Um, because of course now it's so dynamic and so flexible, but that does mean that you need to kind of think about second order, third order, fourth order consequences to a lot of the technical decisions we're making and stuff yeah. like that. So uh, to, yeah, to answer your question on the, uh, you know, on hiring and bringing guys in, uh, slowly. Yeah, <laughs> slowly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can't, you, you can't just let it go too quickly. Um, when I brought in the uh, the guy who's been helping with with the commercial side of things, yeah. that was also quite tricky in the beginning. Um, but you know, it, it's what what I've really seen is one of the most powerful powerful factors in the business. Is even though we're so small, we focus a lot on culture. Yeah, you know, and you wouldn't think of that as a startup. Exactly. But I I read a Jim Collins book, uh, the Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, yeah. and it, he basically convinced me, you know, it's this is the heart of the company. Exactly. And so we started focusing on the culture and the, the strangest things started just automatically happening. Yeah. Before I knew it, the guys were more energetic. Yeah. Um, because I mean, like, you know, we, we are building a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, especially in the early days, we were building a lot of this stuff in our spare time. Yeah. So, you know, this is extra hours, you're tired, this is your weekends. Yeah. You know, that's really where a lot of the dev work had to go down. And ultimately, um, you know, the the culture that we started building out at the end of the day was starting to re-energize these guys after these like years of just building and building. Yeah. And so we started seeing the guys, you know, spending time on the weekends and spending time, you know, just coming after hours and stuff like that, which is obviously it's on their own accord. It's sure. because they love it. Yeah. It's because they're bought in. It's because they see the vision. They, we are all working towards the same dream. Yeah. And that's where I see the power of a culture. And like, it's one of those things where you almost realize it's not something that you set out. It's something that you, uh, you work on all the time and find ways to live yeah. as a company, continuously living it. And you see everyone's guard starts to drop 
and everyone starts to relax a lot more and then yeah. they're more themselves and there's all these like other benefits and then they feel more part of a family yeah. and then they share things of like, you know, vulnerabilities and things like that. And they ask for advice and all this kind of stuff starts to come out of that. Yeah. And we're doing all of this remotely, which is crazy if you think yeah. about it as well. So it's, I mean, it's been a massive, it's been a crazy, crazy journey up to this point. Uh, but you know, we're, we're at a point now where we, uh, the future is just looking so massively bright. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I say, at all times, that humble pie is waiting <laughs> for me in the fridge. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. It, if we focus on what you said, building on culture, how do you do that? At some point you reflect and you say, okay, this is what we need probably, or you try things out and you at some point know it's all right, we need to work on culture. Yeah, I think that um, the first thing is obviously start with a why. Yeah. Like, why do we need culture, guys? Exactly. Okay, so that was the first thing is that I needed to, in a sense, I need to convince my team that culture is a necessary thing because yeah. I um, I was going to bring in, you know, I wanted to bring this culture thing in. We I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, there were some kind of guidelines out there from the book, but I didn't know how to bring the culture in. So the first thing we essentially, I can only say how we did it so far is, you know, we sat down and we said, well, what are our personal values? Yeah. Like, what do we value personally? And then we, we did an exercise where we cross-correlated those values and saw, well, okay, all of us feel very strongly about this, this, and this. Yeah. And then we started coming out with what we called the company code. Okay. okay? And it was a little, you know, okay, it's funny to some degree or, uh, I don't know, uh, clever to some degree because it's code. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we were like, oh yeah, that's okay. We'll call it the company code. Yeah. And um, you know, we kept elaborating on that, and we went through about three or four versions before we felt that it was, you know, good enough uh, yeah. for us to say we could put a stamp on this. And then I started getting the idea. Well, you know, and this is something that we still want to do is, you know, to say guys should sign this at yeah. the end of the day. And you get all these crazy ideas like we should sign it in blood. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, no, no, okay, that's maybe a bit exactly. much. But let's just sign it. You know, even if it's a digital signature or something like that. Like yeah. as long as guys are sitting there going like, I, you know, my name hereby, you know, uh, saying that I will follow, you know, uphold the company culture, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. And then they sign it. And of course that, you know, that's just one piece, you sure. know, so Jim Collins will basically say, well, there's three pieces to a vision for a company. So your, yep. your, co your company, your co core culture is essentially the, the main thing. Yep. Okay. And the other guy who I love is, uh, is Tom Bellew. Okay. He's, he's incredible. And he's, you know, he talks about like the immutable kind of, you know, the, every company needs certain things. And he talks about things like idea meritocracies, yep. uh, you know, and it doesn't matter who comes with the idea, the best idea must win, yep. you know? And like, I've got things where I, I feel very strongly that a team must always stare its problems in the face. Yep. You know, you never sweep stuff under the rug. You never have feel good stuff. We always deal with reality. Yeah. Um, which is something that uh, I, I got from Winston Churchill. Yep. You know, if you read about his stuff, he's like, he's like, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah, you know, exactly. he's, he's so <laughs> stoic. He is so brutally stoic. Yeah, that's know? awesome. I think he's got some really, really great sayings. And, um, you know, the first piece is this, is this, uh, is, are these values. The second yep. thing you need is you need a purpose, yep. your why. It's like your North Star at the end of the day. And you need to be heading towards this North Star at all times. Yep. Um, and the thing is, it, it's a, a purpose for a company is something that should, in theory, be able to withstand, you know, the next 100 years. Exactly. It's like, it's, it's why the company is on earth. Yeah. And What's then your you, company's purpose? If you lay it out in one line. Oh well, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's written down somewhere. Okay. I don't, don't want to uh, risk uh, butchering it. No worries, um, no worries. So then the next thing, uh, but uh, it's so funny um, when we're going through this. One of our our, our founders, uh, Joel, yeah. he um, he always jokes. He's like, the purpose of this company is to unshit show <laughs> so <that's> the <laughs> software industry. <laughs> you know, I'm like it's Joel, beautiful. we can't have that as the as the purpose exactly. of the company. But you know, it's, it's I think it puts it in perspective. It's like it's a complete. Uh, you know, I don't want to use my friend share. But yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that's the second piece. And the final piece is your, what they call the BHAG or your mission. Yeah. You know, your big, hairy, audacious goal. Exactly. You know, and so for us at this point, we essentially see that as being the, you know, an essential tool in the software industry. Yeah. You know, we see every developer when they get their, you know, high end machine. Yeah. Uh, they have a copy of whatever the operating system is. They have a copy of their favorite IDE. Yeah. And they have a copy of Intent Architect. Beautiful. And that is what we want to be in the software industry. We want to be such an, uh, a core piece of the, of the industry at yeah. the end of the day that it's just like, this is how you develop. Yeah. You know, this is how you build software these days. And these are the principles that you, know, you use is you don't, you don't manage, uh, you know, a code base by hand. Yeah. You know, you don't go write every last line of code and then shift it all around with a shovel. Yeah. It's like, we got power tools. This is how we operate. This is how the software industry works. Awesome. And man. so that's, yep, yeah, that's, that's basically, uh, the, the vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. 
Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it was a lot you. of fun talking to you. You too, yeah. And let's do this again sometime. Cool. Patrick, thanks very much, man. Yeah, no problem. Cool.